Poughkeepsie, USA, New York, 1996. Poughkeepsie, a small city with a population of about 33,000, is located about 90 miles north of the Humming. Also in New York City, which is infamous for its high crime rates, significant incidents, and violent offenses, frequently including murder. On a chilly, rainy night in October 1996, Kendall friends were left his rundown family house at 99 Fulton Avenue once more to snoop around Poughkeepsie City, dark streets in search of a sex worker. At 6 feet 4 inches tall and with a massively built, hulking African-American man, he may even appear meek and shy at first glance. However, as the ladies of Poughkeepsie City aside were about to learn all too well, this is not the case. One of the seemingly gentle giants most recognizable and infamous features are his monstrous hands, which proved to be the ideal tools for seizing control of a small, exhausted woman who is desperate to make a few downers. These hands would later develop into little weapons. Kendall had had a less than perfect record of personal hygiene throughout high school and college. Because of the unflattering Monica Stinky, which stuck to him like a fuck, and because he had success with women, he eventually started using prostitutes frequently. In contrast to the previous nights when he frequently used prostitutes, Kendall's life had undergone significant change on this chilly October night. In order to make sure that his victims' final moments on earth were the most gruesome and terrifying of their entire lives up to this point, Kendall would make his first kill tonight before continuing to savagely rip the lives of tortured souls from the streets of Poughkeepsie. Although using a prostitute does not make you a serial killer, it does give you access to a world built on lies, shadows, fear, and power, a breed of working class people that lives moment to moment, fix to fix, and trick to trick survives in this city and shadowy world. Francois, who is a well-known neighborhood figure, would be able to easily fit in despite his size. Although some of the local girls were aware of Kendall's occasionally abrasive behavior, they merely accepted it as part of his personality. He hadn't actually hurt anyone, after all. Eventually, Late in the evening of this memorable night in October 1996, Kendall's hands made their most brutal and barbaric grip of his young and deluded life. Slowly twisting and rotating with malice intent around the slim throat of Wendy Myers, as the last breath escaped her dying, struggling body. Gradually, the neighborhood girls grew more fearful of Kendall, and his slowly emerging Jackie and Hyde personality became more confident and powerful. In October 1996, Wendy Myers, a white woman with a slim build, hazel eyes, and short brown hair was reported missing to Lloydtown Police in Ulster County. This was to be the beginning of a murderous and cunning killing spree that would tragically claim the lives of eight people while miraculously saving the life of a ninth woman who narrowly escaped Kendall Francois to grasp. Christine Sala would live to tell her story to investigators and law enforcement, eventually aiding in the capture of the monster of Poughkeepsie. Gina Perron who was 29 and reported missing by her mother in December 1996, was the next victim of this lustful and sadistic killer who took her life just 10 weeks after Wendy vanished. Gina was described as having brown hair, a small build, and a tattoo of an eagle on her back. She also had a tattoo that read pop on her right arm. On a street corner in Poughkeepsie, she was last observed on November 29, 1996, arguing with an unidentified man. In January 1997, a few weeks after the Christmas and family holiday celebrations, when the nights were still bitterly cold and the streets were still covered in damp snow, single mother Kathleen Haley was out working the streets she was so familiar with. She was last observed strolling down Main Street in Poughkeepsie's Central Business District. Haley was white, had brown hair and had a slim build like the others. Her left bicep was inked with the letter CJ. Like many other women, Kathleen continued to wet the streets and walk the streets to survive and make a pitiful living without realizing the extent of the danger she was in. The now famous Kendall Francois approached Kathleen late one of these chilly nights and she accepted the trick without thinking it was going to be her last. Sadly, Kathleen would also die at Francois' hands along with Wendy and Gina, and her remains would end up in the attic of the rundown house at 99 Fulton Avenue. The police forces in the town of Poughkeepsie and the city of Poughkeepsie became increasingly concerned that the women on the streets of their communities were not safe, so it was decided that something drastic needed to be done about it. However, the reports of the missing women remained non-newsworthy due to many reasons, 
chiefly the social segregation of class and the unfortunate lifestyles of the victims. Law enforcement had begun to suspect that the circumstances surrounding the missing women might be connected, and thanks to that, LT, Bill Secret's tenacity and dedication, a quiet task force was established and the crimes were investigated as though they were the work of a single perpetrator. Sigrist has served in the police department for 29 years. Kendall Francois was not yet suspected of being a serious offender because the reports of the missing people were still being looked into as missing persons. However, he did remain a significant person of interest and a surveillance team was set up to watch his home and movements after reports began to surface about him acting increasingly rough with the girls. Because the surveillance did not turn up any fresh information, Francois could not yet be fully investigated as a suspect. Unaware, 31-year-old Catherine Marsh was reported missing by her mother in March 1997 as winter gave way to spring. It was discovered that Catherine was last seen alive in November 1996. She was described as white, of small build with blue eyes and brown hair. The length of time between her last being seen alive and her being reported missing made the investigation into her case more challenging. We didn't find out about Catherine until August 1998, making her the fourth person to die at Kendall friends were hands. Catherine was a poor victim of his heinous crimes. After no more local poor Kipsy women went missing over the course of the following six months, it was widely believed that Wendy, Gina, Kathleen, and Catherine simply left on their own for whatever reasons they may have had. However, the women's friends, family, and loved ones had different opinions, and they shared the same views with law enforcement, so investigations into the circumstances of these disappearances continued. As they always had in upstate New York, spring and summer of 1997 came and went. However, this year, in the dark shelter of the attic of the house at 99 Fulton Avenue, Poughkeepsie, there were four women's hidden remains that each meant something special to someone. Children kept playing in the street, taking their dogs for walks, riding their bikes and attending school. Working people came and went from their jobs and everyone was welcome to attend Sunday church services. It seemed as though the putrid odor coming from the house on Fulton Avenue had seeped into the ground beneath the structure and no amount of church services, horse fights, or summer storms could ever wash it away. In November 1997, Mary Healy Chikon's father tried to find her in order to break the sad news of her mother's passing. He reported her missing when he couldn't find her, but it turned out that the last time anyone had seen Mary alive was in February 1997. The following woman, 51-year-old Sandra Jean French, was reported missing from Poughkeepsie streets in the height of summer in June 1998. Katina knew master, 25, was then reported missing three months later in August 1998. Early in September 1998, Christine Sole accepted a ride from Kendall Francois. When he tried to make her his ninth victim, she miraculously managed to escape, and when another woman reported her assault, Christine Sole was contacted by police. After taking Christine back to the station, Detective Skip Manning of the City of Poughkeepsie Police Department and Bob McCready of the town of Poughkeepsie Police Department obtained a search warrant for the residents at 99 Fulton Avenue. After that, a search warrant was served at Francois' home and he was taken into custody and accused of attacking Christine Sala. The story of Kendall Francois' life of horror and suffering would now be revealed in the most shocking way Dutchess County had ever seen. Francois was taken away. One of the officers was overheard saying that the two-story, dilapidated aluminum-sided house that Kendall's mother, father, and Sister Shed was the most wretched living conditions he had ever seen. The home was cluttered with trash, clothing, and personal items that covered every surface from the floor to the kitchen counter. But the most vicious assault on the senses was the foul smell that permeated every room. Several members of the investigative team experienced the overwhelming urge to vomit as a result. The team was eventually led to the attic and a basement crawl space where the bodies of several victims were found, so that the painstaking removal of these unidentified victims could start. Extraction and forensic preservation procedures started over the course of the following few days. According to forensic examination, a total of eight victims were discovered at 99 Fulton Avenue. Homicide with head trauma and strangulation was later determined to be the cause of death. Between October 1996 and September 1998, Seven of these eight victims had been reported missing in the Ulster County, Poughkeepsie region. Audrey Puglis, a 34-year-old resident of Westchester County, 
was the eighth victim in Ulster County who was not listed as missing. Eight women who was also reported missing in the Poughkeepsie region and who was initially believed to be among the discovered remains was never located at 99 Fulton Avenue and is still on the missing persons list as of October 2012. When she was reported missing in September 1997, Michelle Carroll Eason was 27 years old. She is currently 42 years old. She is of African-American descent, which led law enforcement to believe that Kendall Francois was not the aggressor in her case. The bodies of all of Kendall's victims were hoarded in his house, and they were all Caucasian petite women. Police lost faith in Kendall Francois' involvement in or knowledge of Michelle's disappearance when her remains were not found with the others. Kendall's crimes were said to have been particularly gruesome because forensic evidence suggested that the bodies were moved after they died, probably to make room for more. When Francois ran out of space in the attic, he went south to the basement. The only thing covering the remains was a thick blanket. Additionally, there were indications and proof of necrophilia. The fact that Francois' family was completely unaware of his activities for two years still baffles law enforcement, attorneys, and many other parties involved in the investigation of this case. Although they claim he gave them justifications, it is hard to imagine how anyone could live in a house where bodies were slowly piling up above and below them. The smell of decomposing human flesh is horrifying and unforgiving. According to reports, Kendall's family believed his flimsy explanations that the smell came from dead vermin and raccoons that he couldn't get rid of. After years of aesthetic and aromatic abuse, it is simple to imagine the olfactory system simply packing a suitcase and leaving the body for the average person who wants to throw up at the smell of rotten fish or funky athletic shoes. Personally, I could not even stand in front of the house on the street without wanting to throw up, much less life there. We all have a threshold. Though, and I'd like to think that the family of Kendall Francois belongs to the segment of humanity that isn't adversely affected by death's foul odor and other unpleasant smells. The circumstances and events in life that would result in a complete breakdown of the body's senses to the point where the brain no longer recognizes human rotting flesh within 10 feet of where you eat dinner or take a shower can only leave one in awe. I feel depressed when I consider the miserable existence the Francois family had been leading. Consider the sad and pitiful past Kendall Francois may have. And remember that any one of us could find ourselves at a dead end in life, unsure of what to do. The majority of us will simply turn around when we realize we're in a dead end, walk back to the beginning of the street, and then choose a different route. But a small percentage of people feel it's necessary to exact revenge on the rest of us. Nobody decides to become a serial killer or a drug-addicted prostitute in the morning. But neither do circumstances or situations turn us into torturers or killers either. Regardless of the motivations behind Kendall Francois' sudden transformation into a monster, he is keeping them close to his empty heart. Kendall maintained a hunched posture, slouched shoulders, and a silent mouth throughout his trial. According to his attorney, his client sincerely regrets his actions. He is still incarcerated in the maximum security male prison of Attica Correctional Center in New York where he is currently serving eight consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. The fact that Kendall Francois contracted HIV and is currently facing the death penalty may be the most poetic justice of all. Kendall Francois permanently altered the lives of the victims, leaving their families and loved ones to move on with their lives. Although I have never lost a loved one to murder, I can only assume that no one would want to see another person go through the pain of losing a loved one in such tragic circumstances. The steely blade of a serial killer's crimes pierces deep into the souls of those who are wounded, forever tying families and friends together through loss and a shared desire to bring the killer to justice. The term closure is quite vague and all-encompassing. I've come to realize that forgiveness and moving on are necessary for people to experience closure. Others will never be able to forgive and they will struggle every day to move on for the rest of their lives. The suffering is only reduced, not eliminated, and the pain never goes away. The hole never fills. In a civilized society, bringing a murderer to justice has evolved into a method of attempting to heal and treat our emotional wounds, but ultimately, another family has been destroyed as a result of one person's actions. I have no doubt that Kendall Francois' mother will go to her grave knowing she raised an innocent young boy who grew up and turned into a malicious, cold-blooded killer. She is absolutely devastated to think that her own son killed other people without any rhyme or reason. Serial killers exist and go about their business among us, whether you view them with disgust, 
morbid curiosity or vile loathing. They don't display a sign that reads serial killer in action, nor do they spot any identifying jewelry or body art that would draw attention to them. You will witness regular people going about their normal daily lives. Some of them might even be parents and married. The most terrifying idea of all is that we don't even know they live right next door to us. They are excellent social chameleons who are intelligent, cunning and sneaky. When it comes to being sneaky and cunning, they excel where they may lack social skills. Every major university in every developed nation is conducting its own unique research into the motivations behind serial killers' actions as well as how to identify and diagnose certain troubling personality traits in children. Numerous discoveries are being made, most of which involve illnesses that are frequently shared and or mental and social deficiencies. These discoveries range from neurological research to family developmental studies and social observations. It is commonly believed that serial killers can be classified as either organized and social or antisocial and disorganized. Ted Bundy was an example of a killer who was both social and organized. Bundy changed the course of serial killer history by being the first to leave his hometown and begin killing in another state. He was charming, charismatic, and attractive. After two escape attempts and three trials, Bundy was ultimately found guilty and given a death penalty for his crimes. He was put to death on January 24, 1989. On the other hand, Richard Ramirez was extremely antisocial and disorganized. Ramirez terrorized Los Angeles from April 1984 to August 1985 killing 13 people and injuring more than 20 others on his rampage. He had poor hygiene, few friends, and a severely drug-added mind. He was given a death sentence in a gas chamber in California on November 7, 1989, during the penalty phase of the trial, in San Quentin State Prison in California. He is still waiting for his execution while he is on death row. Kendall friends who fits the description of a serial killer who is disorganized and antisocial. When considering how crimes can go unsolved for so long, the distinction between the two killer types is important. The serial killer will typically make a mistake. A delusion that they may never be caught and would be able to kill whenever they want will eventually be created if they become too haughty, attention-seeking, or self-centered. In Kendall's case, he simply allowed one to elude him and that proved to be his downfall. One can only speculate as to why he may have known it was time to stop but was unable to do so on his own and needed police intervention to put an end to the destruction. New psychological insights and treatments are created or developed at the beginning of every year to help us understand why we have such monstrous souls living among us. We need to comprehend something as a species in order to feel secure. Understanding appears to give us power in our minds and as people. The human response is to attempt to regain the power when it is taken away, whether it takes the form of being held against your will or worse. If not, we engage in combat. All of this information about human nature is known to serial killers and they will take advantage of it. A serial killer will take advantage of someone's weakness if they can identify it because it's like a drug to them. Each offender picks a different victim and they each do so for different motives. Sometimes a victim is stalked and kept under surveillance for a long time, while other times the choices are purely random and convenient. Once a victim enters a serial killer's bullseye, they are doomed in either case. I am once more brought back to the realization that anyone could experience this, and that is simply terrifying. However, the United States of America seems to produce more serial killers per capita than any other civilization on the planet, more specifically, within the past 100 years. Here in Australia, we have seen our fair share of horrifying monsters emerge from among the gum trees. This macabre character facilitates studies and research into the psychopathy condition, hopefully accelerating the development of better treatments to stop an epidemic of people who believe that killing a lot of innocent people is the best way to solve a problem. Although physically large, Kendall Francois is a very small man in terms of self-worth and character. It is really unclear what motivated him to kill multiple people over the course of two years, but it is abundantly clear that he believed he could get away with it. It makes my brain want to explode that he could so brazenly keep the bodies of his victims in the house he shared with three other family members. Living with an animal or human carcass that is rotting is something I can't even begin to imagine. From a distance, Kendall's inner thoughts appear to be romantically intriguing. But I believe this is only because he has now joined the list of American serial killers who have killed in the 20th century. In truth, I believe that if I had the chance to speak with him in person, 
My stomach would be in a spinning motion the entire time as I tried to fathom why he did what he did and how he was able to put his family in such an unbelievable danger. Ultimately, an earthly judge imposed an earthly sentence because that was within his power and range of control. Kendall Francois will eventually meet his own judge and maker, and the punishment he receives will make his current one seem like a celebration. I don't know him or any of the victims he named, so I can't wish them all dead. But I do believe in karma and cosmic justice and that everyone will eventually have to answer to someone. I find some solace in the idea that the human race is making an effort to combat this illness, which is steadily spreading and getting worse. It would be reassuring to believe that we can find a way to stop such tragic and significant human loss at the hands of egotistical and narcissistic animals who choose to dress in pants and pass for civilized people. Thank you for watching. And don't forget to lock your windows and doors and bring a dog inside with you at night for company. You just never know which psychopathic murderer woke up energized today. So always keep an eye out and be safely paranoid.